Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Brugge. He's a professor emeritus in the Department of Neuroscience. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, and went to Baldwin High School on Long Island. Uh, and then he came out here to the Midwest, to Decorah, Iowa, to study at Luther College. Then he went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to get his PhD in physiology. He came here to UW-Madison in 1963 as a postdoc and never left. <laughs> he started as a faculty member in 1966, and uh, then retired from the, that after rising to full professor in 2003, and he's been emeritus ever since. And I lied because then he went and was a visiting professor at the University of Iowa for 10 years. So you did leave, but you came back. I was a postdoc. Okay, that was good. Tonight, as part of our commemoration of the centennial of the end of World War I, he's going to talk with us about invisible wounds of war, a challenge for neuroscience on the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. It's been pretty interesting to see over the course of my lifetime how neuroscience and brain science have interplayed with this whole idea of responsibility, culpability, and in this case, courage or the lack of it. Uh, he's, John's got a very interesting story to share with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming John Brugge to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you, uh, Tom, and uh, all of you for, for coming out tonight. Uh, before I get started on this story, I, 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 I want to tell you another little story quickly. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with this. Uh, but coming up here and walking past this building reminded me of something I've learned just recently, and that is that this biotech center was not the first tech center on this property. Um, and it, it turned out that um, when the university hospital was built in the 20s, uh, this was a little neighborhood back in here, a little residential neighborhood. And sitting on University Avenue, just in front of the uh, tech center, two, I'll call it, was another tech center, and it was uh, Schmidt's Hardware Store. <clears throat> and um, Schmidt's Hardware Store was there up until around 1926, 27, when the university took it over, took that property over, had to get rid of that building, to uh, expand the school. And somebody picked up Schmidt's Hardware Store building and moved it about two miles to the southwest of here, where it currently stands at the corner of Glenway, Mineral Point Road, and Speedway. And if you want to go find it, it's now called the Village Bar. <laughs> <coughs> I recommend you go visit it. They have great hamburgers. <coughs> um, so let me take you back um, a uh, century or a little bit more and sort of do a quick recap of what was going on in the world at that time. And um, we find that uh, the First World War, also known as the Great War by some, it was a global war, started in Europe, started in summer of 1914. And the U.S. Uh, was late in coming in, uh, about three years late, but it joined uh, in April of 1917. And during that four-year period, uh, there, it, it was a, an enormous loss, uh, mainly in Europe. There were about 40 million people died, civilians and uh, military, and about 15 to 19 million deaths, uh, and, and something like 29 uh, wounded. So it was about the most deadly conflict in, in human history. Um, the um, U.S. lost about 116,000 men, it's mostly men, uh, and there were about 320,000 more sick and wounded. 
And at the end of the war, there were probably a million or two men still left there uh, to come home. Some stayed, some came home, most came home. There were 122,000 Wisconsinites, and about 4,000 of them died. And uh, 192 of those deaths were students, UW students or recent grads. <clears throat> uh, and as Steve Orrick, if you heard his talk last week, very nice talk on the influenza uh, epidemic of 1918, killed more people than uh, actually died in the war. And uh, I, I didn't appreciate this until Steve gave his talk. Uh, and in my reading on the, on the war, uh, there's very little reference to the, uh, to the influenza virus that broke out. And that should have been important because the, the carrier of the virus was, according to Steve, the movement of troops. So the troops were moving back and forth across the Atlantic. Uh, and they were carrying the influenza virus. So when we look at those that died in the First World War, uh, it's more than those that were killed on the battlefield. There were enormous numbers that lost their lives because of the activity of uh, our military uh, during that period. Now, that panel in the middle is one that I came across. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, it, it, it was published uh, uh, this year. And it's a photo of a film strip, which was discovered uh, in, the, uh, in the Imperial War Museum archives. Uh, if uh, during the war, the French and the English had set up, uh, uh, I guess the, they would be microphones uh, around the battlefield, uh, recording the uh, the uh, blasts that are coming from the artillery, the German artillery. And by uh, looking at the signatures uh, that they recorded, and they recorded them on film, uh, they could determine which of the, uh, the guns they were, that were going off. And by uh, geometric tri triangulation, they could get a pretty good estimate of where the gun was. So they found these. And what I found was chilling, almost is on, you, on your left, you can, I think you can see a lot of wiggles on that film. Uh, and the marks at the bottom are, are minute marks leading up to uh, the 11th hour. And then there's a gap. And then to the right is the minute after the 11th hour. And it's silent. It's a flat line. <clears throat> uh, and the engineers have taken uh, the uh, optical image and recreated the sounds that they thought must have come from that. And I didn't bring those sounds along. But you can go to the web <clears throat> and find this and listen to those sounds. And I, I tell you, it's pretty, it's pretty, ch <laughs> pretty chilling uh, experience to do that. So, at the, so the war ends on November 11th, 100 years ago last Sunday. Um, and the guns fell silent. But uh, it didn't end there for um, an enormous number of people, men, uh, who had to get back to their lives. And they found early in the war that men on the battlefield were exhibiting what appeared to be a mysterious ailment. Uh, they would just suddenly lose their sight. They would drop. They would become dizzy. They'd lose sleep. They were fearful. They were hysterical. Uh, and for reasons I've never understood, they didn't seem to know what it was. Uh, despite the fact that those symptoms had shown up in warfare for 5,000 years. Almost all of human history is filled with stories like that. Um, and that's where the term shell shock came into our vocabulary. <clears throat> and it was first published in the British Journal of the Lancet by a man named Charles Samuel Myers. Uh, it was just a very brief, a very brief uh, entry into the Lancet. Uh, and uh, he has three cases 
uh, were, and they were all very similar, of the uh, men who lost their memory, vision, smell, taste, and then were admitted to the hospital. Uh, and he, he, he says a couple of things that I, are worth <coughs> uh, uh, pondering. Comment on these cases seems superfluous. It appears to constitute a definite class among others arising from the effects of shell shock. So this is the first time that the term shell shock shows up in the published literature. Uh, and secondly, the close relation of these cases to those of hysteria, which was a, a psychiatric term at the time, appears fairly certain. All right, so now we, we, we've got, and, and shell shock, uh, as we'll see, it is no longer a term that is used. I mean, it's used, but it has no particular meaning today. Uh, and even at the time, it, 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 there was ambiguity to it. But about a year later, <coughs> a physician by the name of Frederick Mott uh, was able to obtain the brains of two men who died of shell shock, which was called commotio cerebri, the commotion of the brain, uh, without any visible external injury. So it was a, a hidden injury of war. Uh, and he was also the the first one to publish uh, images of brain tissue, shown on the left, <coughs> uh, cells which are undergoing uh, changes that are related to uh, neural damage, uh, the top two panels, and the lower one showing the uh, distension of <coughs> capillaries, which is also a hallmark of, uh, of, a, of a, uh, a, tra a, a traumatic event taking place in the brain. But here's one of the interesting things with, which he wrote. He says, undoubtedly, the vast majority of non-fatal cases of shell shock are more emotional than commotional and occur especially in subjects of inborn neurotic or neuropathic temperament. But the two conditions may be associated. And he says he emphasizes that the commotional symptoms are not influenced by psychotherapy. So here, he uh, in the, actually in the title of the paper, paper uh, he equates commotio, commotio cerebri with shell shock. And down below, in the text of the paper, he uh, he enters into this ambiguity of now we've got an emotional component and we have a commotional component. The emotional component has to do with who knows what. The commotional component has to do with something like some kind of brain damage, even though there are no external signs. So if we follow this a little bit, he came up with two hypotheses. <coughs> this is in 1917, um, where the compression of gases in atmosphere, and we'll see what that means in just a minute, the crane and spine is struck, as it were, by a solid body, and the vibration is transmitted through bony structures to the cerebrospinal fluid, and thence to the brain and spinal cord, causing a molecular disturbance of the delicate colloidal structures of the neurons. And that's remarkably modern in its, its a description. And the second was compression is followed by a corresponding decompression causing liberation of bubbles of gas in blood and tissue leading to embolism. And it turns out that we know that some of that is, is by and large correct. He had no way of knowing that, but he, he uh, was wise enough to have, have uh, figured it out from, uh, from what he knew about the, uh, the, the, the conditions on the battlefield and, uh, and the structure of the brain. Now, after the war, uh, the initial investigation, so the, after the war, and this is a British report uh, in 1922, the initial investigators in the field suspected an organic etiology of this condition, that is physical brain damage. A commission convened by the British government after the war concluded that shell shock 
was a convenient evasion of duty, if not disguised malingering, and that no case of psychoneurosis or a mental breakdown, even when attributed to a shell explosion, or the effect thereof should be classified as a battle casualty. Uh, and it's known that, uh, that uh, in the field, uh, there were some 3,000 soldiers, mainly British, that were brought up for, for uh, uh, treason and uh, dereliction of duty. Three, 300 of those, probably among those who were suffering from this mysterious malady, <coughs> uh, were shot, executed. Uh, and as the report shows, they were taken out and uh, shot at dawn. That was the way it was, that's the way it was. And it, I find this interesting in, in another respect. That Steve Orth last week <clears throat> was talking about the uh, individuals who were caught up in the uh, influenza, in, influenza uh, epidemic. Uh, and uh, they came down sick. Uh, and they uh, uh, couldn't uh, participate in the, uh, in the training exercises for the war. I was here in Madison, by the way. Uh, and they were called lingers. They were called uh, shirkers. So this, this notion that uh, these unknown, <coughs> uh, these were unknown factors at the time, but but that the individuals who were suffering from them <clears throat> were somehow not, because they were all men, they, were, they weren't manly, and, uh, and uh, therefore must be shirking their duties. Well, we'll, we'll we want to look at what was introduced in the First World War <clears throat> that was never seen before on the battlefield. Uh, the, the war was fought on a massive industrial scale. It's the first time that uh, an army was mechanized. Uh, uh, airplanes were introduced, and so were bombs, really explosives, of the kind that were never seen before. And we have to thank for that two individuals. One you recognize is Alfred Nobel, uh, and he was the inventor of dynamite. And then there was Julius Wildbrand. He was a German, and he invented TNT. So the Germans had TNT, the Americans had dynamite. These were explosives that had never been seen before, and they had properties that uh, contributed to our somewhat confused understanding of what these head injuries were that showed no outward physical signs of damage. So these are the explosives that showed up on the battlefield and we still see them today. For the first time, they're called, the first is called a, a high order and this is a supersonic. Supersonic means that it travels at an enormous rate it's uh, about oh, five or six times the uh, velocity of sound, uh, and it's overpressurized, it's called overpressurized. So you have a spike in the atmospheric pressure, about a thousand times, uh, and it's called a blast shock wave. And these are the explosive TNT, nitroglycerin, dynamite, and more modern ones, C4, Semtex, and then ammonium nitrate fuel oil. So the, uh, the trick with dynamite, uh, which, is, which is nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin is very unstable, and so it wasn't very useful as an explosive. Uh, but uh, what uh, no Nobel did, he messed around with it, messed around with it, and tried to figure out how can we use this, mix it with something, and uh, make it stable enough so it, would, it, 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 it could be used. And uh, he figured that out and was able to mix it with an inert substance or substances. Uh, and now they show up as dynamite sticks. But that's really what it is, is nitroglycerin. Uh, and stable enough so you can carry it around and easily use it. Then there are low order 
explosives. These are subsonic. They, don't ha they do not have the blast wave. And this is gunpowder. So gunpowder came to us via the Chinese in about the ninth century. And it's been used in warfare for all those years. Uh, and gunpowder uh, doesn't have the explosive capacity of the high order ones. Uh, it, it, it really burns very quickly. And when it's in a confined space, uh, it, it develops a pressure that makes it a, a, a propellant. So it can heave a cannonball, for example, uh, and a bullet. Um, but, uh, uh, <laughs> and as a kid, I can, maybe you remember this too. You know, you got your first Gilbert, I think it was a Gilbert chemistry set for Christmas. And what is the first thing you do, right? <laughs> you look for the sulfur, you look for the charcoal, and you look for the potassium nitrate <laughs> or sodium nitrate. And you went up to your room and mixed it up, right? Went out in the garage and hit it with a hammer or something. Uh, but that was gunpowder. Uh, and, and, then, and now uh, there are what are known as manufactured. You can buy these things. Uh, or uh, uh, improvised explosive devices, LEDs that we've come to hear so much about in the most recent Iraq and Afghan war. So let's look at what this, this blast is. Uh, so this is the only graph I'm going to show you, <clears throat> but I think uh, it, 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 it makes the point where we're plotting pressure on the y-axis against time on the x-axis. And time zero is uh, when the, uh, the, the explosion goes off. And you can see the very rapid rise in pressure. It's almost instantaneous. And then, and then it falls back, and it goes negative. So you get a very positive uh, uh, pressure, and then a reversal, and a negative. This is over with, from the dotted line at T0 to the uh, beginning of that negative wave in uh, milliseconds, thousands of a second, very fast. A lot depends on what the explosive is and, and the environment and so forth. And this is an idealist uh, uh, pressure wave. So that's what we're dealing with that wasn't dealt with before. And so one question is going to be, well, how does the pressure wave interact with biological tissue, brain tissue in particular? Uh, is it part of the damage that's created uh, with a, a traumatic head wound, and to what extent, and how is that uh, damage created? So there are different types of, of injuries uh, by these explosives. Uh, so the first one is often called a, 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 an overpressure of the blast wave. This is the one I just showed you. The second, uh, uh, which follows the blast wave comes a wind. It's called the blast wind. And it, it's a pressure wave that picks things up. So things get flown around. Uh, debris, bomb fragments, rocks, bricks, any number of things. Uh, and so these things, uh, for any individual that's in the, in the vicinity, can be struck. Be struck in the head. Uh, and even though they're wearing a helmet, say, uh, may or may not uh, be protective enough. Uh, the individual can be thrown, picked up, and tossed. Uh, and they would hit the ground. They may hit a building. Who knows? Uh, but there's another potential for a traumatic head injury. And then there's sort of the all the other stuff that goes along with it, the gases and heat and, and so forth. But the ones that we want to concentrate on are the primary and the uh, secondary and tertiary ones and see how they contribute to a, a traumatic uh, brain injury. A little bit about the brain. Um, uh, so this shows an exposed uh, uh, diagram of a, 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 uh, an exposed brain on the left. 
<clears throat> uh, it's covered by a very heavy uh, membrane called the dura matter. It's now shown here, cut and pulled back. And you can see on the surface the uh, uh, veins and arteries, which are uh, embedded in uh, two other membranes, very thin membranes that lie on the surface of the brain. To the right is a photograph of an uh, exposed human brain, something you might see uh, looking over the shoulder of a neurosurgeon once he takes the cap of bone off and opens the dura. And you, 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 I put it there kind of so we appreciate uh, what might happen. Uh, you can almost imagine what might happen if, if uh, the head is struck uh, in such a way uh, that forces are applied to that brain tissue. We'll take a closer look at that. Now, if we look at the brain in cross-section, uh, it gives some clues as to what might be happening. Uh, on the top is a, uh, a cross-section, cut like that, a slab, actually, uh, from autopsy material, uh, unstained, and you can see on the edges the dark uh, surround uh, known as the gray matter, and that's where the nerve cell bodies lie. They're packed in there uh, by the millions. And the white area is called white matter, and those are the axons of those neurons covered by myelin. So they're myelinated axons. These are the large axons. And they are connecting distant areas uh, within the brain and between the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, and below you can see stained on the left, the cell body stain uh, for microscopic study. And uh, those are shown in blue. And on the right is a section pretty close to this one in which it's stained for myelinated axons. And, and those are in the black. So you get a, uh, a sense, you start thinking about, well, what happens if the brain gets distorted by a blow to the head of either a blast or if something strikes it or if the head strikes something? Uh, what might be going on here? Let's look at the blast wave first. So this is a model. We really don't know. Uh, uh, what a blast wave does in a complex tissue like the brain. <clears throat> uh, but the time, so these are four instances in time of a blast wave moving from your left to right. Uh, and this is time in milliseconds. So this is a blast wave that enters the brain and within a fraction of a millisecond can actually pass right through the brain. Now, the blast wave is from a physics standpoint, and the physics of blast waves are pretty well known, <clears throat> uh, behave like most other waves, like sound waves, for example. Uh, so they can uh, meet an interface, uh, and when they meet an interface, they interact with that interface, can be reflected back, pass, some of it passes through, can be refracted, bent. So we don't really know what the biomechanics of a blast wave is. And this is one of the crucial things to come to understand if we're to ever understand what the mechanism is of blast wave injuries. So for secondary and tertiary injuries, uh, this is where either something strikes the head or the head strikes something. Uh, this is a, uh, an acceleration, deceleration injury. Uh, so that the brain, as we saw, is sitting in a, 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 a hard skull, surrounded by a, a thin layer of fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. So it, it in, a, in a way, kind of sloshes around. Now, under normal circumstances, like we shake our head and stuff like that, uh, the brain can take that, no problem. Uh, it, it, uh, but there's a point, there's a threshold where, where uh, too much of that 
too much of that acceleration or deceleration is going to create an injury. And this is what that looks like diagrammatically. So sitting there on the upper left is the head in place. And let's say something comes and whacks the front of the head like that, throws it back violently. Uh, because of the inertia of the brain, it it's moves differently than the skull. And what happens is that the frontal lobe actually crashes into the front of the skull. The secondary uh, to that is the head now throws, is thrown forward. So you now get a contra injury. It's called a contra coup. And then in a post injury, you've now got, uh, and what that little cartoon is up there is meant to show a, a neuron. Uh, meant to show a neuron which is damaged as a result of that. But, so these are, the t these, are, these are two things that are affecting the brain, the blast injury and a impact injury that results in head acceleration and deceleration. Now this is shown with the head thrown front to back. Now of course, we, in, a, in a situation, say on the battlefield, where an, a soldier is thrown, uh, his head can be hit from any direction, or it can hit anything. And it, it's one of the things which is most damaging is an angular acceleration, something which is a twisting motion, like that. And it might look something like this. So now here, here's a head that's flipping like this. And if you remember the picture of the brain, <clears throat> the brain sits in the skull. There are two hemispheres to it, one here, one here, divided down the middle, uh, separated. They're separated for a long distance. But uh, that space is occupied, and it's occupied by a septum. It's a, uh, it's a, a membrane, it's a thick membrane of dura and a vein sitting right there. Uh, so now think if the head is thrown to one side, you can see what could happen. One is, uh, on that mannequin, the right cerebral hemisphere, the one that's upward, hits up against the dural membrane at the, mid at the midline, and the one on the right, the left hemisphere, continues moving. And what happens is you get a spreading of the hemispheres. Now, if you remember, what's connecting those in the lower right, you see the white matter connection between the left and the right is a very large, very large bundle of axons, myelinated axons called the corpus callosum. This is what allows the two hemispheres to talk to each other. One of the most damaging effects of having a traumatic head injury like this is an axonal injury. So not only are the neurons themselves damaged, but more damaging, in fact, <clears throat> is the, the, the twisting and turning and, and stretching of axons. There's a limit to how far they can go. Uh, and we'll see some pictures of that at a, at a microscopic level. Think about, it's sort of been likened to uh, having silly putty. So you get a silly putty and you pull it out and do it slowly, stretches out, goes back. But if you give it a good snap, you break it. And that's kind of what happens here. So now we're dealing with what in 1914 uh, was, was, was called shell shock. Uh, with its ambiguity between an emotional component and a commotional component. The commotional component uh, we can consider now being what we call a traumatic brain injury, TBI. The emotional component, which comes down to, it, down to us, is post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Now, how they got these names isn't really important. Those are kind of sort of semi-interesting, semi-interesting stories. But in any event, uh, we, we now see continuing forward 
100 years, we still have now two uh, conditions to deal with. One is the result of a physical trauma to the head that doesn't leave a scar, that is an external scar, and then we have an emotional component over here. And to what extent do they relate to one another, or do they? Now, that's a complex story, and so <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off PTSD. Uh, it, the circuitry involved, <clears throat> the neural circuitry in, in the brain involved with PTSD, is becoming understood, uh, and it's different than the injury uh, of, uh, of, a, of a TBI, uh, although a TBI may also involve a, P a, a circuit involved with PTSD, if that makes any sense. So let's uh, now focus on a traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> so like I said, traumatic brain injury comes about through uh, the result of an acceleration or deceleration of the head uh, in a violent way what the threshold is, we don't know. Uh, and um, that can be mild. We, we see it all the time. Uh, somebody gets a, a concussion. They may not uh, be unconscious. They're kind of woozy. Used to, in the old football days, call it having your bell rung. Um, and uh, and People usually recover from it. It may take a little while, and uh, uh, but then they're back on their feet. And for all intents and purposes, it uh, uh, considered to be recovered. All right. Um, in the uh, returning vets, uh, we'll see there was about 80 percent of returning vets with head injuries are of the mild type. It's an injury, it's hidden, and they go their way. There are more, uh, there are more traumatic ones, uh, which we're gonna kind of put aside uh, and uh, look more at those for which uh, we don't know what the long-term consequences might be. So let's just look where research has taken us over the last hundred years on these two uh, uh, injuries. So th this is not a super scientific study, and it wasn't, it's not mine, uh, but somebody went to the trouble to uh, search the literature over the last uh, 30 years, from 1990, so it's years on the x-axis, each, each bar is a year, out to 2016. And on the y-axis are the number of articles, published articles in peer-reviewed journals that relate to uh, traumatic brain injury of the mild type in the military. Uh, and for about the first, from about 1990 up to 2010, Right, 20 years, and then backward to the 20s. There's almost nothing published on it. Now, why would that be? Well, it isn't though it wasn't known. Uh, it, it really comes out of the history of, of uh, boxing. So in, in the 20s, uh, it became recognized, and there was a paper published, uh, on boxers who were exhibiting the same kinds of behaviors as soldiers that came off the battlefield in shell shock. And so the natural thing was, well, these boxers are like that because they're getting beat up. Their heads are getting beat. So this must be the result of repeated blows to the head. And it was called the punch drunk syndrome. And they discovered that, yes, there is, even though you can't see this damage, these are damaged brains. That was 1928. From 28 onward, as far as we know, 
even in, in sports, there was very little, very little that was published on it. Uh, of course, the other thing is that, uh, you know, after the war, we kind of drop our guard. People, you know, soldiers go home, life goes on, uh, people forget about it, uh, except the people who have to live with it. Um, but there's, there's really not much of a recourse. Um, and uh, there's, there's no public policy developed to fund research of the kind necessary to really understand what's going on. So if you don't have funded research, you don't have researchers, and you don't have papers published. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, so what happens, so the, the, the gray bar there is 9-11-2001. And now we enter into, into Iraq, Afghanistan uh, conflicts, and for, oh, I don't know, eight or nine years, there's still nothing going on. Still nothing going on. And why is that? Well, after 2001, there were two million or so service members deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq. And about 350,000 of those sustained a TBI. And about 82% of those were considered, uh, considered mild. Concussions, right, but head injuries. Oddly enough, uh, the Department of Defense prior to 2010 had never required a medical examination of soldiers on the battlefield that had had head injuries, except to have them self-report. Now, if you think about this, you, you, you're on a battlefield, you're blown away, and uh, not silly, and they hand you a piece of paper and say, well, tell us what happened. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened, I can't remember this, and so on. Uh, so in 2010, they changed from self-reporting to a medically diagnosed, clin clinically documented, and mandatory screening for specific events. And it's, it's where that arrow is right there. So things start to pick up about that. Now there are a couple of other things that were going on, unrelated to the military, which I think uh, uh, sort of We'll tie some things together here. And to introduce you to two people, three, one you don't probably have to be introduced to. Uh, so one is a fellow by the name of Bennett Amalu. You may remember him. Bennett Amalu was a uh, forensic pathologist, neuropathologist uh, in the Pittsburgh area. Nice guy, doing his job. Uh, below is Mike Webster. Mike Webster, you know that I've heard. Mike Webster was a football star here at UW. 1974, he was uh, all Big Ten, drafted uh, in the fifth round by the Pittsburgh Steelers and played with them up until 1990. Then he went to the Chiefs. Uh, but he was all pro about seven or eight times. Uh, and he was a center, uh, and an aggressive one, probably considered one of the best of the interior linemen in the NFL. Mike Webster fell on bad times, uh, and he uh, uh, had serious, uh, uh, serious mental, uh, mental issues. Uh, physically, he uh, became a wreck. Uh, and he died at the age of 50. Uh, and quite coincidentally, uh, Mike Webster now meets Bennett Amalou on the autopsy table. You remember this story, perhaps, from the movie made, which is called Concussion. Uh, Will Smith plays Amalou, so a wonderful picture, movie. Uh, so Amalou, as the story goes, uh, does the autopsy? He looks at he looks at uh, uh, Mike Webster. Never heard of Mike Webster. He doesn't know anything about football. He's a Nigerian doctor, hasn't got a clue about American football. Um, and but he looks at this wrecked 
body, uh, and then takes the brain, and the brain doesn't match what the body tells him. He was totally surprised. And he said, well, what's going on? What went on with this man? And so he, he carried that through, <coughs> and he uh, sectioned that brain and stained it and began to follow a lead here, as a good uh, uh, neuropathologist would do, and uh, made an important discovery. And I'll get to that in a second before we uh, see Anne McKee. Now, Anne McKee is a neuropathologist. Her specialty is in neurodegenerative disease. She's at the VA hospital in New England. Uh, she's a UW grad. She graduated the same year Mike Webster did uh, in 1974. <clears throat> uh, so she went her way, Mike went his. She's from Appleton, Mike's from uh, Tomahawk, went to Rhinelander High School. Uh, and Ann McKee became interested in Oliver's work when he described Mike Webster's brain. And then that eventually led to looking at the brains of individuals who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. So now things shift. But it, it was the discovery uh, that Amalu made in the brain of Mike Webster as a, as a sports injury, which now carries over into looking at traumatic brain injury in the military. So I'm going to show you some of the, the uh, images. So this is, these are two images published by Amalu. On the left was published in 2005. Uh, uh, and the right was published in 2009. So on, on the left, you see that dark staining cell. That's an abnormality. <clears throat> uh, and the abnormality is in a protein within the cell. <clears throat> called the tau protein. And the tau protein is a protein which does a number of things, but one of the important things it does is it stabilizes the, the, uh, the uh, uh, neurotubules in the cell, and particularly the axon. So these are like long hollow noodles that run down the length of a <laughs> nerve cell. And they have to be held in a certain configuration. And this is what, what uh, tau proteins do. But for some reason, they can become uh, distorted. And so they, they take on weird shapes, and they become tangled. And these tangles now result, and they can be stained for selectively. So this is a selective stain for a abnormal tau protein on the left. On the right is an Iraqi war veteran in a paper published also by Amalu just four years later in 2009. Very similar, very similar. So now we have a, uh, a connection between a uh, uh, injury took place in sports, head injury, and one which is now taking place on the battlefield. And he called this, he named it, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. And that's come down to, now, now that's been used and is being used. It, it kind of fits into the uh, categories of brain, uh, uh, brain injury and the signs of brain injury, but it has its own pathology. So it's characterized anatomically by these protein tangles that can be selectively stained for, uh, and uh, believed to be, believed to be, and this is really important, <laughs> believed to be, uh, result from repeated blows to the head, resulting in multiple concussions. And it's characterized behaviorally by memory loss, problem solving ability, depression, anxiety, aggression, and so forth. Very similar to some of the uh, uh, symptoms observed in patients with uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So we have now a situation where 
we, we have uh, sports injuries, uh, which are making headlines. Uh, if, if you read the papers about the, uh, about the traumatic injuries to football players, but it's not just football players, it's amongst all of the sports that have physical contact, uh, you would think that, boy, every football player out there uh, is going to end up with a chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy. Well, Anne McKee, who has studied now 120 of these, maybe published them, all but one, she says, she's found these tau particles, abnormalities. Even in very young players, uh, ergo, this is a very dangerous sport, which it could very well be. But then you start thinking, well, how many uh, individuals have played football, you know, at a pretty high level? Thousands, thousands and thousands. So we have, we have a case here where, uh, from a scientific and experimental design point of view, there are some weaknesses. Uh, it's a sampling problem because all of the brains that have come to these, in, these labs have been volunteers, self-selected, and people who have donated their brains because they have the symptoms that uh, lead them to believe that, that they've got some sort of traumatic brain injury. So it's a, it's a sort of a circular kind of situation. Well, you say, well, what do you believe? How do you believe it? What kind of weight do you place upon something like that? Uh, well, the weight, as I see it, that you place is you say, well, uh, and there are several labs that are doing this now, coming up with the same observations. Um, Anne McKee has looked at thousands of brains. She knows what this stuff is. She studied this stuff. And when she says, I've never seen anything like this before, and it's highly unusual that a 24-year-old, 19-year-old brain would have this stuff in it. I say, well, it, we have to assign some weight to that. On the, other hand, on the other hand, is there any way that we could actually design a scientific experiment to test that? And we'll see how we might do that in a minute. Okay, I'm going to show you some more pictures of this. This is. This is another from McKee, uh, 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 a healthy brain shown on the left, stained up on the right, the aggregated tau proteins uh, from a 45-year-old retired football player. So these are sort of standard, now seen quite frequently. Uh, here's, here's again comparing on the left a normal healthy brain, uh, low power on the top and a high power on the bottom. In the middle is a retired NFL linebacker. And you can see the dark staining on the top and higher power at the bottom. And on the right is a, an old boxer who lived to be 73. Um, and his brain is pretty well messed up. Uh, but again, uh, there are a lot of boxers who are walking around having been pretty well beaten up, but they seem to be in otherwise pretty good shape. All right. So now McKee has, and her colleagues, <coughs> this is from McKee's lab, uh, have collected a fair number of these uh, from individuals in the Iraq-Afghan wars. Uh, and, uh, and so she has maybe a hundred that she's reported on, something like 60% of them show uh, this tau protein abnormality. Well, and, and, and the headlines on this would be a uh, 27-year-old uh, military veteran of Iraq, Afghanistan, showing signs of, of uh, CTE. Uh, the other is, uh, she would say, they would say, this was done to a, because of a military blast exposure. So here we're coming back to, well, okay, we, we, we 
see that this, these individuals have abnormal proteins. So they have an abnormal brain. Uh, and we know that a uh, traumatic uh, blow to the head could be associated with that. But how about a blast? How do you separate a blast from, the, from a, a traumatic head injury? Or is the blast a traumatic head injury? Uh, we don't know. Because in, in, in the, in the, I've never been in the heat of battle, but I can picture it. How, how, can, how could you separate uh, one from the other so that you had a pure blast injury or a pure uh, traumatic head uh, blow? So that's another one of the, the uh, things to keep in mind as we try to interpret this. There are other proteins which are abnormal. Uh, these are glial cells. Glial cells are the non-neuronal cells in the brain <clears throat> they have a lot of functions uh, uh, involved and show up uh, in cases of inflammation and of injury. On the left is a healthy brain. On the right <clears throat> is a, uh, a military, again, blast explosion. You see the brown showing uh, abnormal protein this time. It's a different protein, one associated with uh, a, a glial cell called an astroglial. And as I mentioned, the uh, axonal pathways are particularly susceptible to, to stretch. And this is a, an MRI, special kind of an MRI, which allows one to track long myelinated axons. And the, it's color-coded, so each of those colors represents a, a neural pathway connecting one part of the brain to another. Uh, just to emphasize that you can, uh, by distorting the brain, you, you, you can easily stretch those. And the report on that, this is one of the earliest reports on uh, brain damage to axonal injury, back in 2000. Uh, on the left, uh, you see these uh, black images, uh, the, swe the swellings. Those are axons which are swollen. Uh, this is now uh, staining for a uh, neurofilament, neurofilament protein. Or uh, there are bulbs on the right. You see these, these uh, kind of expansions. Uh, in, in any case, these are abnormal, and so one would expect that whatever these axons were connecting or are connecting, it's going to be an abnormal connection. The information flowing from point A to point B in the brain is going to be affected. How else could we study that? Well, the big hope is that we would use a some non-invasive imaging technique. One of the problems here is that, that the uh, traumatic brain injuries are, are, uh, are discovered uh, uh, only post-mortem. Uh, so uh, we really want to find something to be done in a living, a living human being. Uh, and these images, imaging techniques, uh, show some hope. But they're not selective enough they're not sensitive enough, and they're not cheap enough. You could never do this on a large scale with the current imaging technique. So in special cases, they can be done. OK, let me just take you to one example of how we can now begin to, uh, begin to uh, track the, uh, the uh, mechanism of, of blast trauma against a uh, uh, a blunt head injury. So this is being done out at the VA hospital there uh, with a mouse, with mice. Uh, and uh, uh, on the lower right, it's called what's well, a blast tube. It's a long, long tube divided down, the, whoop, uh, divided uh, by a membrane. And behind that membrane uh, is built up a high pressure. At the other end, 
at the end of the blast tube here is a little mouse under anesthesia, strapped down to a board, uh, sideways to the blast tube. They fill that chamber with gas until the membrane ruptures. It shoots a blast with a profile similar to the blast profile I showed you earlier, and it hits the mouse. Now you calibrate that in such a way that uh, the mouse gets up, shakes himself off, recovers, does okay. One of the interesting things that they did with this is they set up a camera above the mouse's head, a very high-speed camera, to capture the movement of the head when the blast hit. So uh, there's on the x-axis is movement in one direction, y-axis is the mov movement distance in the other. And if you track the arrows, you see that uh, when the blast goes off, which is over there on the right by that red bullseye, uh, the head is shoots up to the left. In 15 milliseconds, it's there. It then makes a left-hand turn, does a circle. 20 milliseconds is up in the corner. 30 milliseconds is over here, and then it's back to rest. So this whole event is over in about 30 milliseconds. And what is it? It's a bobblehead. The little mouse just there and just goes Doop, like that. Just <coughs> jolts him. Oh, the mouse gets up, shakes him up. Well, what the mouse didn't know was that something happened. So on the left is a healthy mouse, the right is a blasted mouse. The, the, the uh, ex external features of the mouse look the same. You don't see a lot of trauma, you don't see, you don't see broken blood vessels and so forth, but below, you see on the left, the tau protein uh, for a healthy mouse and on the right of the blasted mouse. So even though there's no outward sign and the mouse is up walking around, it's got uh, uh, the same kind of, same kind of uh, injury that we saw with a blunt instrument. One, just takes one. But they did a whole bunch of experiments, yeah. But it'll, it'll happen with one. And down below shows another uh, molecule that also shows up, uh, which, which is a molecule that, take, that's, that uh, is, uh, shows up in brains where there's, uh, where there's uh, uh, an injury. So the idea here is now that what the blast does, one thing the blast does, is while it may itself interact with brain tissue, it actually just shakes the head. So an individual who's out in a field and now is next to a IED, uh, it's a blast. That blast reaches him or her in milliseconds, passes through the brain in milliseconds, and gives a jolt, just a jolt. Now, we have to scale that, of course, from a mouse to a human. but. That's the kind of experiments now that have to be done in order to be able to sort out what the different mechanisms are for these two kinds of injuries. All right, so this is the cascade, and we'll just kind of review here. So the physical forces act on the brain tissue. Brain tissue blood vessels are distorted and torn. Inflammation can take place. The blood-brain barrier, which I haven't talked about, could break down. Axonal injury, astrocytes uh, develop. And from there, uh, things get a little bit dicier. So you get tau protein tangles, amyloid plaques. We haven't talked about amyloid, which also shows up sometimes in these uh, damaged brains. And neuronal death, death and neurodegenerative disease. So this is all very iffy uh, because one of the fears is that, that uh, and one of the thoughts is that damage, even though it isn't a major traumatic event, may eventually, through a cascade like this or with other intermediaries, lead to a, a degenerative, uh, degenerative brain an Alzheimer's brain, Parkinson's brain, ALS brain. We don't know. So here are the challenges. 
and there are many others. What are the biomechanics that triggered traumatic brain injury? What are the cellular molecular events? Uh, can these be arrested or reversed? What are the other factors? Age, genetics, contribute to traumatic effects of brain injury? Is it a risk factor for neurodegenerative disease? What needs to be done to develop biomarkers? These are, this is really critical because, as I said, we're now diagnosing this in postmortem tissue. Uh, what we really need to, to do is know what's happening in the living human. And we have to know right away, and we have to know it in, in a, a large scale, and that means cost, one of the really critical things. So biomarkers, those, those molecules that show up in the blood or the cerebral spinal fluid, urine, for example, <clears throat> that correlate with brain damage or more sensitive brain imaging. Uh, we don't have that yet. What do we have? Well, in uh, 2013, Obama uh, announced what was called the Brain Research to Advancing Innovative Technologies, acronym BRAIN, uh, pumping uh, billions of dollars into brain research over the next 10 years. This is just a, what this really means. Uh, and this is not just the U.S., but this is taking place also in the U.K. and in many countries uh, in uh, sharing data and uh, uh, trying to uh, get at some of these really naughty, naughty problems. And you can see all the contributors to that. Here in traumatic brain research, the major player is at the bottom. It's the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. This is a 10-year no, it's more than that. Started in 04 uh, and goes all the way up until 21. Uh, trying to understand the, uh, the mechanisms underlying the, the uh, development of Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and here they're doing it in a very careful, controlled way. And preliminary results are just starting to come out. So it'll be in the next five to 10 years, we'll see some advances here. So this is where we come in 100 years. H.G. Wells in a book, War to End Wars. Woodrow Wilson picked that up. It became the slogan of the First World War. And Alfred Nobel, the man who contributed so much to, to what's happened on the battlefield then and now, he says, my dynamite will sooner lead, sooner lead to peace a thousand world conventions, as soon as men will find that in one instant whole armies can be utterly destroyed, they will surely abide by golden peace. But Lloyd George probably had it right when he said this war, like the next, is a war to end war. Well, thank you so much for coming. If you have questions, I'd be glad to try to. So, with the compression of the body and the increase in blood pressure, and the increase in the blood pressure, and the increase in the blood that sounds pretty destructive to you. It does. It is. Can you repeat the question, Doctor? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the question was, that a, I think it was the blast wave. 
Yeah, a, a couple of things. If you go back to the first war, this was a, a huge issue in getting men back. Uh, uh, there were two things. One, they were running out of men because they were dying so many of them, right? They, were, they, couldn't, they couldn't afford to not put their troops back in. And the other was compensation. So the fear was, well, if, if now what we saw with a, uh, uh, an emotional side of this, if that became now a casualty of the war, you're going to have to pay for that. And this, could, this, this, we just can't do that. So that was behind some of that. Another, so another thing that you brought up, and I'm glad you did, is that, uh, so the blast wave doesn't just hit the head. In, in fact, the damage is, as you, as you know, is to, is to all of those cavities, mainly the gut, the lungs, often called blast lung, middle ear gets blown out. Uh, these are the real sensitive. In fact, there was some thought that the blast actually created a uh, intrathoracic pressure uh, sufficient to actually drive the um, drive the pressure up into the head. Probably not the way it works, but it could. But that's. It's very well thought of, and by the way, the most frequent disabling injury of veterans goes unnoticed, which means they can't hear what they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a reason why they can't hear. Yep. Oh, sorry. Are there other non-invasive metrics like uh, the blood-brain barrier to measure that uh, for the effects? Uh, yeah, and uh, so the blood-brain barrier, the blood-brain barrier is that line line of cells uh, uh, around capillaries that uh, wall off the brain from the the uh, circulatory system. And so it's selected, there's very tight junctions here. And so molecules can pass in and out. But if that breaks down, then you have a flow which is bi-directional, can go in or out. And so uh, that, can, that can really disrupt things and be destructive. Because uh, uh, eventually the, those things will heal up, but that takes a while. Uh, so the breakdown, and the way, and the way that one can can determine that uh, in part is by looking at uh, the uh, concentration of certain molecules in serum or in CSF. Because if they're leaking out, uh, then you're going to start seeing the, the, uh, the titer of those going to go up. So there, there are a whole bunch of those markers which are used to look at uh, potentially a breakdown of blood brain barrier. They get that right? Sort of. Another question. So I was wondering about oh, these tau proteins, uh, do they exist on a micro level in the brain and the physiological impact causes an accelerated growth of them? What causes these proteins to evolve? The, you mean the what? Well, you have the tau proteins that, that show up as in, uh, in a much larger image right. when checked within the brain. Are the, uh, do those tau proteins exist before that physical? Oh, they do. Yes, impact, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. impact causes an acceleration of growth. Correct. Yeah. There are about, there are about a half a dozen kinds <laughs> of tau proteins <clears throat> within a, and, and most of those are in the brain. Uh, but they're in, other, they're in other organs as well. Uh, and so in, in terms of the structure of the neuron and the breakdown, uh, they support the microtubule structure of the neuron. Uh, so they're bound to it in a, in a physical configurational way. Uh, and for reasons that are not at all understood, that protein now takes on a different configuration. And when it does that, it, it detaches from the tubules. The tubules begin to collapse. And so the whole thing then ends up in a tangle 
and can rupture the can rupture the neuron. So the tau protein actually can flow out of the neurons, and in advanced stages, it's detectable. It's detectable in uh, the, the cerebral spinal fluid. But that's what happens apparently. I mean, at at the single cell level. Does that make sense? Yes. Does yeah. everybody with a damaged tau protein exhibit symptoms? Will everybody with a damaged tau protein exhibit symptoms? Well, that's a good question. We will everybody who has a, has damaged uh, tau protein exhibit the symptoms? That, that was a question. Well, that's what we we can't tell because uh, 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 we can't do it in a human because we can't take humans that have no symptoms. Uh, and we can't cut every brain of individuals who die without symptoms. It, it, it's, 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 it's very difficult to, I mean, you consider the size, you get a human brain, it's pretty big. Uh, and, and so when you, when you sample uh, bits of a, of a human brain, you have to make some decisions as to what you're gonna sample. You can't cut and look at everything. It's, it, it's impossible. Uh, so you, you, you could be missing things, and so even if you had a whole a, a bunch of normal brains, <clears throat> you may find, I suppose you would find some, some abnormal tau protein in it, uh, but you never know what caused it. You know, individuals die, they, you don't know the history to the extent you'd want to as to what might have caused that. You know, a person falls down and bangs their head. Well, that could have been enough to just create a small lesion. But it doesn't show up, some, there are no symptoms to it. So what the threshold is, you know, how much of that has to be going on along with other proteins and, and other cells and other processes, how much of that has to be going on before it tips over and now it starts to become uh, uh, exhibiting this, the, the symptoms. So right now it's symptomology and post-mortem examination. Any questions? If not, thank you very much.